You are listening to Be The Change, a podcast of conversations with true visionaries who are creating new paradigms for a healthier planet and society. I am your host, Christine Demick, and my work is in finding real solutions to the biggest problems we face today, climate crisis, capitalism, social injustices, and our failing health. There are amazing humans out there that have answers, and it is my mission to have their voices heard. Together, we can raise consciousness and create a just and equal society. Together, we can be the change. This October 22nd will be 10 years since much of New York City was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. With millions of dollars in federal funding, it wasn't until this past year that New York City started to take action on making downtown neighborhoods more resilient to ever-increasing storms. Unfortunately, the plans approved and forced onto residents by former Mayor de Blasio, with the support of our city council and current Mayor Adams, reads like a typical political playbook. How can we make things worse and spend billions of dollars doing so? Today, I am joined by Ali Ryan and Tommy Love from East River Park Action. Both Tommy and Ali have lived in the Lower East Side for years, are lifelong activists, and have experience in New York City politics. They fought with the city for a true climate resilient plan in their neighborhood, but unfortunately were unable to stop the city from cutting down 700 mature cherry trees, destroying their amphitheater, and leaving behind an asbestos problem that still is not remedied. They will give us an inside view on the remarkable battle against the greenwashing that took place in East River Park and how they will continue to fight for transparency. Welcome, Tommy and Allie, to Be the Change. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So for those who are unfamiliar with East River Park, I'd love if one of you could give us an idea of its size and not just the size, but the importance it has to multiple neighborhoods in the Lower East Side. So East River Park is almost 60 acres and it spans from right above 10th Street, probably close to 11th Street or 12th Street, and then goes all the way down to Montgomery Street and it borders the East River. And on the other side, it is, it borders the FDR. There are, I believe, four or five entrances into the park from the community. And it was built in the 1930s under Robert Moses. Ali, I wanted to reiterate that, I mean, everyone goes to this park. Yes, this park is always full. Like we have a greenway that goes all the way down to Battery Park. I mean, it goes actually loops around to Hudson River Parkway. For bicyclists and runners, a safe thoroughfare. But for children, I have two elementary school aged children. Like we've been going to the park to play sports because we don't have the ball fields that you have or the tennis courts or the track and field anywhere else in lower Manhattan. And it's amazing. You can go at different times of the day and you see different groups of people of all ages in the park. And like on the weekends, you'll see people having dance parties or having cookouts, playing Quidditch. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. I just want to mention one thing, because a lot of us, including myself, are very critical of some of Robert Moses' projects around the city. However, what he did recognize is when they built the large concentration of NYCHA housing, which borders the FDR Drive in the park, over 100,000 people live in that corridor in NYCHA housing. He said, they need a place to play. They need a park. How can we build all this housing and not have any place for recreation? So that was one of the reasons when they built East River Park, it has playing fields, it had the amphitheater, it had tennis courts, it had a track, It had a field house. It was a fully operational, very large community park. And now everyone in New York would know, like it started at two bridges, right? Or a little bit lower, Chinatown? 
No, it actually starts literally at Montgomery Street, which is above the Manhattan Bridge, even. It, okay. It really starts there, but begins to fill out when you get closer to Grand Street and Delancey Street, which is where the amphitheater was. And then the, all the ball fields, and the tennis courts and the playing fields were north of that, up until about 10th Street, where it narrows down and then goes into Stuyvesant Cove. Okay, so what we would say is more Lower East Side all the way up to the East Village. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so multiple families would go there. And as Ali said, that we have also, for people who run, going from, I don't know, Gramercy Park down to LES is not a big deal. I mean, you know, it's a beautiful run. It's along the water. You see the bridges. I live over on the west side, but I would often, when I take cars over, you would see people out there exploring and you have the ball fields and the children. And now what do kids do? Do the kids have an area now, a ball field that was all taken away? Well, we right now, 70% of the park is demolished and the 30% that is still open to the public. There are ball fields. I don't know when the permits expire but at a certain time they are going to expire that the little leagues cannot play ball anymore. And then I think what people have told me is like, oh, we're going to have to go to Randall's Island. Because like right now we don't have any public tennis courts in lower Manhattan. The last time I checked, the tennis court in Stewart Park was demolished. Like you just don't have a place to go to. Yeah. Well, one of the things that was promised as part of the mitigation and the, quote, phased construction was that 42% of the park would remain open at any one time. However, the problem is they've cut down, even in the northern section, a lot of the trees have been cut down. And during the hot days, we actually had a team of people who were part of Lower East Side Breathe, which is one of our sort of offshoot groups went out, measured the temperature in the park. And on a hot day where there's no shade, for example, on the track, the temperature reached 150 degrees on the track. And that's what the city has said is our mitigation. They also put in what they call the passive lawn, which they told us, which was put in only in December, brand new side, covering an area that used to be where the Lower East Side Ecology Center was, that is now totally burnt and brown because nobody maintained it. And the third part of this is we were promised Pier 42, which is at the southern end of the park, was also supposed to be part of mitigation. And they promised that that has some tennis courts, some open space, but has no shade, no bathroom, no water. And the temperature there was also above 130 degrees on the surface during the hot days. That, they promised, was going to be open by the summer. From what I know, I think today is the first day of fall, and we have not seen Pier 42 open yet. Let's come up to this. We, You know, we're coming on, what, the 10-year anniversary of Sandy? Right? Yep. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of fanfare here in the city and a lot of politicians bringing out the microphones and the press, right? And I was personally here. I was down in, in Fidei. But tell me, what parts of your neighborhood flooded during Sandy? Well, I'll give you mine and then Allie can give you hers. Yeah, because yeah, really I know good. you're south and Allie's north. Yes, well, I live directly across from the park at Grand Street. And I've been here for 45 years, as you mentioned. And during those 45 years, there has never been a storm where the water came over the Esplanade. Never. Sandy was the first event in the history that I've been here, 45 years. And as far as we've looked back in the history of the park, that the water ever came over the Esplanade. So the water did come over the Esplanade. But a big protector of our part of the community was the park, because the park absorbed a lot of the water that came over the Esplanade and sort of protected our part of the community. My building did get a foot and a half of water. The parking lot that my building has, we lost about 100 cars. 
but the water never got beyond about 100 yards inland from the park. And then within 12 hours, the water totally receded. The park was literally open and people were in the park. It needed minor cleanup, but everything, including the amphitheater, all the park buildings, everything survived intact. Okay. And Allie, what happened further up? So we had a bit of a different experience. So I live closer to Con Ed and the curve of the FDR between 14th Street and 18th Street. And that is where the floodwaters came in and went down Avenue C. And so my building was flooded up to the doorknobs. So my first four neighbors, as well as the businesses, lost everything. There were businesses that did not come back. Restaurants were basically that night having cookouts because we didn't have power because the transformer blew. And honestly, it was just incredible, the camaraderie of neighbors not knowing each other coming together. And there was one place called the Museum for Reclaimed Urban Space. They had bicycles that generated power. So you could go there to charge your cell phone, (laughs) which I just think is awesome. But we lost power for a week and it took a long time, like a, a good year for people to clean up and rebuild their homes. I remember actually, and more specifically, they have a basement and it flooded eight feet in their basement. And that's where all the power in the building was located. And so when they redesigned their power grid, they made sure that the fuse box was over eight feet high off the ground. Yeah. So that wouldn't happen again. But I know that floodwaters did come from the park and go over the FDR and come to Avenue D. But for me, for where I live, the floodwaters came from Con Ed being compromised. And like when I looked at the plans, the, the new plans that are in play right now, back in 2019, that was actually my biggest critique is that They hadn't done anything to take care of the curve between 14th Street and 18th Street. And I remember Lorraine Grillo, who was one of the commissioners testifying between in front of city council and council member Rivera asked her, like, what have you done to take care of this area? And they said, we haven't done anything. We'll get to that in time. And every time I look at the plans, even in 2022, like there's nothing been done to that area. And Con Ed hasn't been publicly held accountable to share what they have done because whatever they do affects my building, it affects yeah. my, my family and my neighbors. My building doesn't have any formal sort of flood protection. So whatever the ESCR provides, that's my flood protection. Let me give maybe two minutes of background because sure there's a lack of understanding about what this project is does and what it doesn't do yes and there are three sort of legs to flood protection or protecting the community one is to protect us against storm surge the other is to protect us against sea level rise and that's all that escr does it does nothing to protect us against an Ida-type rain event. It only protects against storm surge and sea level rise. And that's why they're raising it eight feet. The third leg of this project is what's called the parallel conveyance. And that's a redoing of all the sewers that are in the park and are on the Lower East Side. Because what part of the problem was not only the flooding from what came in over the river, but rain events. Mm -hmm. Ida was a rain event at three inches an hour. And the current plan is only being planned for 1.75 inches of rain per hour. That's all it can take. After that, everything sort of west of the 
Avenue D will flood again because the sewer system, all our water gets pumped through a pumping station and then across the river to the Newtown Creek uh, disposal area. Yeah. So the pipes, the capacity they're building for is 1.75 inches per hour. If we get a three inch per hour rain, this does nothing for that. And the area where Alley lives, that's what I'm saying. There's a difference in topography also. Of course. Where I live, we have sort of a slope down towards the river. Uh-huh. So we have sort of a natural barrier. For example, the amphitheater was a natural barrier between the river and the community, even though they decided they had to destroy it. Where Alley lives and west on Avenue D, there's a bowl effect. So if you don't have the proper sewage and a way of getting the water out of the community, then there's nowhere for it to go but to sit there and accumulate. There is another part of this project which nobody ever talks about, which is a separate $350 million project going on and nearing completion for all the NYCHA projects and residences on the Lower East Side. They are building, each one of those now is walled in and resilient, the infrastructure, from any future flooding. And one of the things I want to mention is what we really asked for which was part of what the city is still hiding from us, was we wanted interim flood protection, something that would protect us from the water coming over from the park or further north from coming south. And that's accomplished by a number of ways. If you look around the city, for example, in the seaport area, they use these hassle barriers. They've used other temporary barriers to prevent the water from coming into the community. Yeah. We said, while we look at a plan that makes sense, please give us interim flood protection. Because right now, by the way, until this park is protected, we have nothing. Right. We are vulnerable to any kind of storm for the next five, or we don't believe it's five years. For the next time, we are totally vulnerable to any storm that's coming. We have no interim flood protection. Tommy, so one of the things I really want listeners to understand is because there's so many spins by the news, and we all know that the New York City government has a huge PR machine behind them, is that the residents of the Lower East Side want resiliency. I think that's the thing, is that what you're, oh, I'm hearing from you is that you flooded and that you don't want Alley, right? You don't want water up to your <laughs> doorknob again. Just as, you know, people in FIDI and everywhere else, you know, we don't want this to happen again. But what we're trying to explain to everyone is that what the city is doing is not a climate resilient plan. It's taking away our green spaces for reasons I don't understand fully. And maybe I'm hoping you can give me some insight on that. And doing these five-year projects that are going into the pockets of what we know as big construction, big real estate, right? And we're unprotected during that time. And the thing that you mentioned is that in your 45 years on the Lower East Side, Tommy, you never had water come over. That was once in a hundred year storm. We know we're getting more hurricanes, but what we really are dealing with right now in New York City and bless our friends in Queens are these rain dumps, these rains that you said three inches in an hour. And this plan the city is coming through with, it will not help that whatsoever. Okay. So you guys banded together, right? And we live downtown and they first broke us up into three areas. There was the Lower East Side, there was the Seaport and there's Battery Park City on how they were going to handle this after Sandy, right? And we all dealt with it for not just months, but years of just these plans going back and forth and money being spent. But then what I want you to do is to take me up to, I think it was basically last year, is that we were still talking, but in the Lower East Side, they just suddenly just pop this plan on you? They just start doing construction? Is that right? Well, what happened was after Sandy, 2012, the city realized they had to do something. Yeah. The federal government came up with some money. The city applied. People got together and they came up with what they called the big U, which was not really a plan, 
but a concept to put a barrier around lower Manhattan. And that makes sense. None of us disagree with that. Made and, sense. But the Army Corps of Engineers, right, when it was going to cause problems with the flow or maybe certain. No, but the city got a $350 million grant. Okay. And then they started visioning sessions. We started meeting with the community. And that went on for several years. And the community had come up with a concept, which was a series of berms, some walls that might be necessary in some places. And it would have included the loss of maybe of about 200 trees at the time. And the community accepted that. We knew something had to be done. And we were going along with the idea that obviously it had to be engineered and it had to be looked at. And then in December of 2019, all of a sudden, with no notice to the community board, the elected officials, the city announced that they were going to demolish the whole park. They had a new plan. They were going to raise the park eight feet, and it was going to cost $1.5 billion. The community plan was only going to cost $750 million. And honestly, we all have a lot of conspiracy theories, but we've never uncovered why the city did this. Mm. There's a lot of pressures from the development community. We know down here and other things that we could look to. But most of us have just said, we're concerned about flooding. Justify your plan. My building, I live on the 18th floor. I had to walk 18 flights of stairs for a week. I yeah. think I, I had no water. No bathroom. Do people think that this is what we want? I right. mean, we're the most vulnerable people, but we don't want a bad plan. And that's what, unfortunately, we have wound up with. And I love, Ali, you had said, like, the camaraderie that you saw. Listen, if you're going to be in a disaster, there's no place I would rather be than New York City. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we get a bad rap here, right, for who we are. But hands down, I want a New Yorker at my side, because we help others. We do. We may be busy on the streets and whatever, but when it push comes to shove, when there's a disaster, there's no one you'd rather have than a New Yorker. We're going to help everyone. And and we did that. So you guys, you gathered and you created this coalition, as we all do. And you had a remarkable amount of resources behind you. You had money, you had lawyers, you had press. I mean, you had a full on fight against the city to stop this plan that wasn't resilient and it it didn't happen. And I would love if you could share some of that, of your battle and maybe help us like some insights that you got on this. I mean, we've raised money, yeah, but like usually when you're going to go into a lawsuit against the city to oppose a rezoning, lawyers tell you raise a hundred thousand dollars. We didn't do that. I, th- I think, was it like $40,000, Tommy? Well, originally, yes. So it's not so much that we had the money behind us, but it's just like we live in the neighborhood that people have been environmentally savvy for a long time, like sort of like the genesis of the community gardens yes. start in the Lower East Side. So you have a lot of people who are very knowledgeable So it's just like we're very passionate about like green infrastructure as opposed to what the city's creating is called gray infrastructure, which is like a flood wall, which that's been used in the past. But we're now in the 21st century. We're learning you can use other techniques. So it's not a people were rallying together. Like it was more just people wanting to do the right thing as opposed to people came out who weren't necessarily active in politics or maybe not even reading the newspaper on a daily basis, but they became politically active because of this project. And I do want to say, you know, we did go to court. We fought the city. We had Jack Lester, who had the precedent-setting case on alienation. I think you have a different situation, for example, in Wagner Park, it being in Battery Park City. But East River Park is a an official park. And in New York State, we have something called alienation, where you are not allowed to touch a park without either compensating the community or making some plans for the 
community during construction. The city went, and so we went to court on that. It's a hundred year old state law, which is one of the best, strictest laws in the country. So we went to court understanding, and the city acknowledged, by the way, that alienation was a problem. And in the value engineering study that we had to go to court to uncover, they said that the community would be entitled to up to $300 million in return for the loss of the use of the park over the period of time. So we went to court, and we first went to state Supreme Court, and the city went in and told the judge that if we don't do this construction in the year 2050, 2050, the park will flood twice a day due to tidal flooding. Now, there is no scientist on earth right now who will guarantee what is happening in 2050. If we don't attack climate change, if we do nothing, the projections for 2050 are off the chart. So, by the way, and the city acknowledges that the plan they're building yeah. may have to be totally redone in 2050 because they don't know what the exact height of sea level rise might be by then. So they're actually building the park with the ability to add additional two or three feet at a later date, but they're not doing it now. So this park could have to be totally destroyed again in less than 30 years and rebuilt again. So we went to court and then we lost because the judge bought the city's line without any proof except some obscure study that was done by one scientist that it would flood twice a day in 2050. We then went to the court, the appellate division, the next highest court, where we got a stay and an injunction because they believe that we had a case. They don't want to issue an injunction unless they think you have a, a chance of, of winning. So during the injunction, we went to court, we argued it, and then unfortunately, the court came up with new law. They now said that if a park is destroyed, but if there's a community use, that it's okay. So they said because there is going to be flood protection, that you can go destroy the park and no worry, you don't have to do anything. And then the appellate division, the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in the state, we went there, and they actually issued an injunction, and then mysteriously, the injunction disappeared. Just disappeared? Yep. And they ruled in one sentence that they dismissed the case. <laughs> so, you know, Ali, I wasn't trying to make light of saying that you had money. I, I know what it means for a neighborhood, you know, and ours as well, trying to raise money to get the lawyers, et cetera. But I guess what I was trying to say is that the resources you had, you made excellent use of it. I mean, look how high you took this to, in court, right? And then it all stops with it just mysteriously disappearing. And then the, did they start the next day? 72 hours in a row, they destroyed everything south of Houston Street. They worked 24 7 for 72 hours because they knew that once they destroyed everything, they thought that the fight would end. Yeah. So they literally destroyed everything in 72 hours. Unnecessarily. Yeah. Unbelievable. Spitefully. Spitefully? We believe so. They were laughing. You know, we were there witnessing it. They had guys laughing and cutting down trees, and they were having the best time of their life. Don't forget, this is $2 billion. And... Let me give you an, one more example, because this is what's so frustrating. Part of what Carlina Rivera said was one reason that she supported this was it was going to be a big economic boom to the community, and we were going to get a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, minority and women-owned businesses. Totally not true. 95% of the people who are employed on this job come from outside of New York City. They come from New Jersey. Westchester, Long Island. Again, what happened is so crazy because we went to Scott Stringer at the time the contract was going to be signed. Yeah. And he looked at the contract and he said, 
the city has a minority women-owned business requirement. You have not fulfilled that requirement. I'm not going to sign the contract. You know what happened? What? De Blasio signed the contract and said, I don't care. So then what do we do, Tommy? I mean, you've got decades in politics. You know this better than anyone else. So now as we come along with Wagner, which, again, is a different situation, but it's a battery park, et cetera. But th- there's more along the way. What do we do? Like, how do you fight them? And, well, win? and by the way, ERPA is a 501c3. It is a nonprofit which does not get directly involved in politics. Mm. But the rest of us, we are all residents of the Lower East Side. Yeah. So we wear two hats, okay? We as individuals do get involved in politics. And Ali is an example. Ali is run for, for the city council, which is, I respect anybody who puts themselves out there and runs for office. It is not an easy job. No. Our elected officials have played this, I'll support you, you support me game. So everyone, Carlina decided that she was going to support this. Everybody else said, fell into line and said, I am not going to oppose her because I need her to support me and my projects in the future. So we wound up in this mutual aid society where everybody was afraid to speak out and they all supported each other. The only way to defeat that is what just happened in the congressional race. We had two local candidates who both ran, who should have been favorites and should have been able to win this race because they lived in the community. They actually lost to an out, somebody who lived in the community, but never held local elected office. And the reason was because those of us in the community who were intricately involved said, we can't support you anymore. Mm. You abandoned us for your own political needs. And that's not who we are going to support in the future. So the two candidates who lived in Manhattan, probably one of them, they only lost by a small amount, yeah. should have had the support of this community and would have had they taken the stand that we believe they should have on the part. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. I find it very interesting that when it comes down to the issues that are really matter, they're nowhere to be found. Nowhere, you know, and they are getting voted out. But then we have someone new coming in, as you mentioned, you know, we have Goldman coming in. Do you see that there's any hope for saving our green spaces down here? Like, what is your plan now? You have 300 trees left, right? <laughs> yeah. Allie, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, we're trying to figure that out right now. Okay. Um, I will say I am going to run again for city council because good for you. Saving East River Park was the center of my platform. But there are other issues going on as well. And everything's declining. Everything's getting worse. Yeah. And so I felt like I need to run again and because the issues that actually affect us residents, my council member Rivera won't address them. She won't have to face them. Yeah. But I will say what I have personally found being on the activist side with ERPA, as well as with other groups, there is power in numbers. As much as the city wants us to think we're powerless, we're actually not. And I think working with the media, and it can be small, local press, it can be national press. But I think just putting out there our side of the story and the facts ultimately will win the day. And so that's my hope for you for Wagner Park. Mm -hmm. But I think right now, the big question is, what do we do next? I mean, right now, I think we're functioning holding the city accountable, demanding that city council hold an oversight hearing. Like, it's not okay that the city is disregarding the negotiated terms of the ESCR. Specifically, like, there's only 30% of open parkland available to the community, where there's supposed to be 42%. Lanes of traffic are closing on the FDR when that wasn't supposed to happen at all. And probably like on a very urgent note, like the air monitoring 
is not being released on a consistent basis. And they're also not replanting in empty tree pits around our, in our neighborhoods that was negotiated to be done. Yeah. So holding the city accountable is, is very important because it's like, if we are writing letters to our elected officials, reminding them like this needs to be done and testifying in public hearings, having it on record, you can't ignore it. Yeah. Uh, Let me give you another another example. One of the things we are focusing now on is oversight because we don't want to be poisoned on top of everything else that's going on in this park. Yeah. And just recently, by the way, they disclosed that they found asbestos in the amphitheater area. Yeah. Because they didn't know there was a sub basement, which gets us nervous again right away. Because if you're spending a two billion dollars and you have the top engineers in the country, you'd think you would look at the previous plans of the park and know that there's a sub basement there. So they recently found asbestos. The other thing is they claim to be doing air monitoring and soil monitoring. And we do have reports that they did prior to ESTR going in that the entire park, you have to remember, is landfill. That landfill contains arsenic, asbestos, cadmium. This was all done in the 1930s when landfill came from factories and all kinds of places, was not tested. And we know now that the area is filled with hazardous materials. So in March, they told us that they did testing on the soil again. And so I asked, I'd like to see the data. Yeah. Let's let's see it. And you know what they said? What? You have to submit a freedom of information request. We're not going to give you the data. So in April of this year, I submitted a freedom of information request to get the soil test from March of this year. And I just got them two days ago. 180 pages of data that now we have to go again because they don't tell us anything. They don't analyze it for us. They don't give us any help. The community board also, I have to tell you, is not been very helpful in oversight. So, for example, you know, everybody heard, and this was good, about Reese houses. Reese houses had arsenic in the water. And they still haven't determined the source. And they claim now that it was a mistake. Yeah. But again, they won't release the data. They have said in press releases with Reese houses that there was no discernible level of lead in the water, but they don't give a number. Yeah. In other words, this is not a novel. This is data. This is science. There's a number right now that they know about the amount of arsenic in the water. Yeah. And they have not released that number. And the other thing people should know is even then, the levels set by the federal government are so high that most experts in the field say, For example, if you have ongoing exposure to arsenic, Mayor Adams went there and drank one glass of water. Right. He doesn't drink the water every day. Right. Or bathe in it or cook in it. And there's a total difference between accumulated exposure and drinking one glass of water. That's correct. President Obama went to Flint and drank a glass of water there, too. Exactly. And we get suspicious. Well, we don't get answers. If they yeah. give us the answers and the answers are good, we're fine. Right. But they're not giving us the information, which right. makes us incredibly worried and suspicious. One of the things that was very apparent to me was that they're not so smart when it <laughs> comes to resiliency. All right. And I think that the problem is, is that the communities are far more advanced and have far more information on what climate resiliency is because we live here and we know what's coming our way and we may or may not own our property, but we do have our home and we love New York City. We love our city. We love our neighborhoods. We want it to survive. And it feels as if that they just, I don't know if the money expired or what, but they were just like, here, we're just going to do it. And don't even take into consideration the real problem, which is the rain bombs, you know, the rain coming down at three inches an hour and not the sea level rise, which, yes, we do need to address. I think when they go to the press and a lot of people 
even on Gothamist, which is unfortunate, is that, you know, the people are like, well, what do you know? They say it's NIMBY, not in my backyard. No one wants their parks destroyed, but we need resiliency. And so they're making us look as if we don't want that, which couldn't be further from the case. It's just that we know that we could have saved nature and we know the importance of nature well, in our health you, and in climate resiliency. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, j- just that exactly right. In East River Park, they're talking about raising it eight feet. From Montgomery Street to the Brooklyn Bridge, they're talking about putting flip down and flip up gates, a totally different approach. In the seaport, they have no idea what they're doing. Right. <laughs> because, you know, still. And then in Battery Park, they're making that floodable. There, they're probably doing the best plan because they decided because of all the monument and what's there, they couldn't destroy the park. So they're raising the esplanade to an appropriate height. Then if it floods, they say they're making it floodable so that the water would recede, which is what we had. And then in Battery Park City, they're coming up with like a whole litany of crazy plans. When, for example, the ball fields, from what I understand, are protected now. So it's been like they've cobbled together. It looks like every design, (laughs) every contractor, and every permanent... Because, by the way, for example, Jamie Torres Springer who came over from HRNA, which is one of the major development and design companies in the city. De Blasio brought him over from HRNA to DDC, Department of Design and Construction. He's the one who was there when this plan was sprung, okay? Carl Weisbrod, who goes back and forth between city planning and HRNA. And this is like the permanent revolving door that yeah. we're, we've been caught in with Bloomberg and de Blasio and Giuliani and now with Adams. And it really requires, unfortunately, the electorate, and this is not easy when you're fighting the machine, to recognize what's happening in their communities. Yeah. Because, by the way, besides East River Park and Wagner, we have Elizabeth Street Garden. We have two bridges. We have the seaport. I mean, pretty soon we're going to just be, you know, as the old song goes, they're going to pave over the park and make it a parking lot. That's right. And that isn't the solution. I mean, over here in Wagner, Tommy, Battery Park was made to flood. So Wagner Park actually did exactly what it was supposed to do during that storm. It flooded and then it went down and it went back into the river because they have built through the grasses holes and a whole system where the water gets pushed back out and we lost one or two plants, the gardeners say. So now they're going to pave it over and they're going to put on more cement and it's just not the answer. And I don't know. I don't think we're going to hit that today, but perhaps we get smarter people like Allie into the city council. When is that election, Allie? It'll be next year. Next year. Okay. And that is uh, Rivera's district right now, right? Okay. Well, I mean, people don't want to hear it, you know, and I think that's the unfortunate part too, is that we spend our money, we pay high taxes and we just want it to function. And that's just not the case. I understand. It's like you get your kids to school, you work your job, you put dinner on the table, you go to bed and you get up and you do the whole thing over again. But now you're going to have to put in an hour of our time every day to like help fight the system that's supposed to help us. The answer is yes. Right. (laughs) <laughs> well, luckily, I'm, I'm retired and have yeah. the time, but we have a lot of people, their parents, yeah. they work. I have literally probably spent 20 or 30 hours a week for the last five years doing this because I, I have the luxury of doing that. And by the way, to me, as I said, I live across the street. One of the great pleasures of living here is to be able to walk across the street to a park yeah. where we had trees and the river, and you could even go watch a Little League game if you wanted to, and it's gone. It's horrific. And if that isn't enough for it to make it matter to you, I don't know what else to say. I mean, in the beginning of this podcast, you told us that the temperature there with the trees down, we need trees. 
and we need mature trees. We don't need saplings because the saplings are just going to get washed away with the next storm and they don't provide the shade. I don't know what else to say to people, but to get involved and it matters. It really matters. You know, for example, after Sandy, we did lose some trees, but we lost more trees because the parks department never went in there and flooded the the roots of the existing fresh water to flush out the salt water that was there. We have people who told us simple thing to do. Not every tree would have been saved, but they could have certainly saved a number of trees. First of all, we're doing things. And then now, one of the things everybody can see, we're not maintaining what we already have. Right. And what's going to happen with this? You know, yeah. and as you said, they said five years, it's going to be 10. And who suffers is the people in the neighborhood. It's just a shame. Well, please tell me, how can people help? How can people help East River and help your coalition right now? Well, I think the best thing is, first of all, we have all our information and our update requests on our website, which is eastriverparkaction.org. One word, eastriverparkaction.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, where we give information and alerts about what is happening. Do you need people who maybe you know soil, who can look at the soil samples and help you? Well, if there are any experts in this field, and the field goes everywhere from soil to air to civil engineering, we'd be happy to have their help because right now, again, we don't have experts. We have to find experts and pay experts if we have to. In other words, the city never came forward and gave the community a pot of money and said, here's some money for you to do some oversight independently of us. In fact, they wouldn't even, the person who hired the environmental engineer who's doing the oversight in the park is the contractor. So the community asked that that's interesting, but we really don't think that the guy who's the contractor to be paying the environmental engineer because that looks like a little bit of a conflict of interest. And so we said, just give us the money and let us go hire an independent environmental engineer who reports to the community. Yes. And it was denied. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to break the system down. I mean, it's clear, right? You know, I mean, people, you got to get involved. Well, so, okay. So I want to ask each one of you this question, which is you go through this and, you know, as we just covered, we all have to get involved. We have to spend our time, whether we like it or not. That's what it's about, right? Community. What keeps you getting up every morning and being the change and not giving up? So Ali, I'll start with you. My family. As my husband and I were dating, we agreed that the farthest we would move away from our home was a block. (laughs) We really love living here. So I do it for my family, for my friends and their children, because we're raising our children here together. And I want my children to hug 80 year old trees one day. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. And Tommy. Well, what keeps me going, I, as I said, I moved here 45 years ago out of choice. And I found the Lower East Side the most wonderful community to live in that you could imagine. In fact, I used to have people, some, some relatives, some strangers, who used to say, how can you live on the Lower East Side? And I used to tell them, how can you not? And I used to joke with them because I used to say, like Allie, even if I won the lottery, I was not leaving here. This was the community that I loved and it, incredibly diverse, vibrant. We have artists. We have people of all ethnicities. It's a jewel in the city. And that's what keeps me here and keeps me fighting. Plus, I have to look out the window every day yeah. and look at what they've done at that part. And that motivates me. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you both. Thank you both for being on the Be the Change today. And again, can you we get that website one more time? EastRiverParkAction.org. Wonderful. 
Well, everyone, please go and help and, and do what you can. Thank, Thank you, Christine, you. for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and are inspired. We grow with supporters and listeners like you. So please share this podcast with your community and follow us on Instagram at bethechange.nyc. And to learn more about our guests and what you can do to be the change, go to our website at www.bethechange.nyc. That's bethechange.nyc. Thank you and be well.